tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome, dear listener, to Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Set aside some moments now and take an adventurous ride on a journey into the psyche of some talented writers. They will dig into your being and titillate you. Oh, I love that word, titillate. While the stories may not all take place in the heartland, I am delivering them to you from the heartland. My intention is to strike fear and confusion into the mind, soul, and yes, the heart. This is Fear from the Heartland. Hello, Heartlanders, and welcome to Season 3, Episode 14 of Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Hey, Heartlanders, you guys patrons yet? Visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to join the club. You'll get ad-free versions of this and all our other podcasts, including hundreds of standalone releases from our audio archives dating back to 2012. It's a great way to show your support, and you get a whole lot for it. I've heard the worst part about online dating is when the girl lists her weight as 115 pounds, but when you're lifting her to put her in your trunk, she's obviously well over 140. Personally, I never joined one of those online dating services because I preferred to meet someone the good old-fashioned way through alcohol and poor judgment. Spend a bunch of time in the padded room, no telling the weird thoughts that hit a person, huh? Two stories tonight by Malcolm Tanner and newcomer Raz T. Slasher. Let's get after it. Do dreams really have a basis? Is there any reality in dreams? Or are our dreams just another manifestation of reality? You ask yourself, did something happen in real life that I am suppressing and telling myself it didn't happen? In the battle of dreams versus reality, it is not always clear to a confused and depressed soul what is true and what is not. Olivia Manson battles her debate over dreams and reality in a way that she thought may never have been possible after a cheating husband ruins her life. Her confused soul may never be the same again. And now for your indulgence, Olivia by Malcolm Tanner. One. A loud screeching noise interrupts my shower. Reaching for my towel, I hear it again, only louder. I get out of the shower and towel off quickly. Listening carefully, I don't hear the screech I heard earlier and think to myself it must be nothing. Probably just bad plumbing in this older home. I put on my white jeans, the ones that fit just right. They go so well with the new aqua top I bought yesterday, laying on top of the bed. I am going to see my new guy friend that I met online. He looks so handsome, and his eyes make an electrical current pulse through me. We have a date to meet at the park, and I want to look my best. I've been friends with guys on the internet before, mostly chatting, but I have never gone to meet someone I found on the net. I finish dressing and I hear it again. A loud screeching noise like claws upon the door, causing me to jump. I go to the stair railing and downstairs. I usually don't scare easily, but I am curious as to what that noise might be. I grab my jean jacket and quickly throw it on before descending the stairs that lead to the front hallway of our home. I stop. 
go on down. Don't be a chicken. I heard something and I know I must check it out. What could it be? I open the front door. There is no one there. No scratches on the door. Nothing. I start to go back to my room to finish dressing. When I reach the top of the stairs, I hear it again. This time, I am sure something is there. A screeching, scratching noise, sounding like claws against metal. The back door, I think. That must be it. The back door that leads to the screened-in porch is metal. The screeching stopped as I make it halfway down the stairs. I pause and listen. I hear nothing. Silence. I take two more steps and breathe, straining to hear what I think is an animal scratching at the back door again. Suddenly, it gets louder. The sound isn't like a dog or even a cat. It's getting louder and the screeching is sending chills down my spine. I make it to the bottom of the stairs and proceed carefully towards the back door. A loud crash, sounding like it came from the living room window being broken, makes me run instinctively for the back door. I open it to escape, but I can't. My internet date is standing in front of me, but something is terribly wrong. He shouldn't be here. How did he find me? He doesn't have hands. He has claws. He opens his mouth and bloody fangs and horns on his head appear as I stand frozen and in shock. His claws reach for my throat. Hello, Olivia. Darkness. Two. The light in the room woke me from my dream. I have this dream often and there seems to be the same ending. Always a good looking stranger I met on the internet dream comes to my house and tries to kill me. I always wake up not knowing the ending. Did he kill me? Did I kill the demon with the sharp claws reaching for my neck? I never seem to find out as the dream ends the same. Darkness. I get up and slide out of bed to make my coffee. Just out of curiosity, I check the front door. There are no footprints or scratches. I walk next to the back door, open it, and find nothing there showing anyone or anything has been near the house. I knew that would be so, but I check nonetheless. I grab my coffee and head to the couch. I open my laptop and log on. Today I will look for an internet date. It had been a year since Tom left me and I was lonely and needed companionship. All this internet dating stuff is making me have these awful dreams. I quickly close the laptop and stop myself. Maybe it isn't meant for me to have someone else? I take a sip of my hot steaming coffee and ponder my thoughts. My phone rings and I see it as my friend Lauren calling. Hello, Lauren. Olivia, hi. I just found out there's a new bar in town opening this Friday night. I thought you may want to go. Uh... I don't know, Lauren. You know the guys you meet in bars. They are just out for one thing. Usually not looking for a long-term relationship. Well, Olivia, not to be critical, but when's the last time you've been with a man? Aren't you getting, well, needy? You mean horny, Lauren? Sure, sometimes. But not to the point I must throw myself at someone. I always thought that looked bad on most women. You know throwing yourself at a man come on Olivia let's make a night of it I'm not asking you to throw yourself at anyone besides it's been a while since we did something fun together okay okay I'll give in do you want me to drive that's okay Olivia I'll drive myself you know just in case the man in my dreams shows up okay to the new bar on Friday it is I hang up the phone and laugh to myself at my friend Lauren. She had always been the adventurous one. Me, of course, the shy one. I took my relationships slow. Lauren was speedy and upfront. She knew what she wanted and was not afraid to ask. I, on the other hand, tend to take my time, freezing a relationship before it even gets started. Maybe this Friday will be different. We'll see. It's Thursday and I need to get dressed for work. I go upstairs and turn on the shower. The hot water is calming all the nerve endings that were stimulated far too much last night. I rinse my hair and turn towards the back of the shower. 
Through the steam, I see a face? What the hell? Tom's face? Just as quickly as she thought she saw her ex-husband, his face vanished into the steam. Tom? Hello, Olivia. I know I don't hear that. It can't be. Can it? I turn off the water and peek around the shower curtain. Barely open, I see nothing but the steam that has now gathered on my mirror. I grab my towel and begin to dry off. I would have to blow dry my hair, but today I decided to let it be curly. I didn't want to stay in here too long. The episode in the shower is giving me the creeps. I begin to wipe off the foggy mirror and reach down for the toothbrush and toothpaste, looking back up at the mirror. I jump and lost my grip on both the toothbrush and tube of toothpaste. The claw, the one that reached for me in my dreams, was above my head. I scream out loud and duck, covering my head with both hands, waiting for my imminent demise. But there is nothing. I want to peek from my covered eyes, shut so tight it was giving me a headache. Do I dare? Slowly, I open a small gap between my index and middle finger. Nothing. I turn my head around and look upward. Nothing. I raise myself from a squatting position and look back into the mirror. Nothing. I must have something wrong with me. This dream, this crazy dream is consuming me. Damn that Tom. He's the cause of it all. I think too much about him. That's what it is. It's Tom giving me these bad dreams. The evil son of a bitch that he was. I shake my head and get back to finishing drying and putting on my clothes. Do I need therapy? I finish dressing and head to grab my purse and keys, head to the garage, and start the car after opening the crotch door. I back out and close the door and head off to work. Driving down the road, I hear the voice again. Hello, Olivia. A chill goes down my spine. 3. I return home from work on Thursday and have a boring evening. Watching television and a cup of hot tea before bed isn't exactly killing it like we will be tomorrow going to the new club with Lauren. Lauren and I had an on-again, off-again relationship as friends, depending on if she was attached to a guy or not. When she was single, we hung out a lot. If she had a steady relationship, we saw each other very little. But even with all that, her love life and single life far outdistanced anything going on in mine. I had looked at dating sites often, but I couldn't get myself to jump into it, mainly because I kept having these bad dreams about online dating. Was it me, or was there really that many bad people out there? You hear it in the news all the time. It was hard to trust anyone after what Tom did. He ruined what I felt was the strongest love I ever felt for someone. The cheater brought his girlfriend to this house. I caught them here, in our home. I feel my face flush with heat at the memory of such a horrible set of circumstances. Whatever was on TV was now just a blur, and all of it came rushing back to me, causing me anger and tears. I hate myself for feeling this way. I must put this in the past. I promise myself tomorrow will be better and head up to my room. Friday night would be here soon, and I, Olivia Manson, will take control of my demons and have fun tomorrow at the new bar with Lauren. I toss and turn, unable to turn off the flow of thoughts consuming me. Damn that, Tom. My parents were right, which I hate, but I should have never married him. They nagged me to no end about not marrying him until I couldn't take it any longer. I married him just to disappoint them. I wasn't going to let them control my life any longer, but in the end, they were right, and it was Tom, that damn Tom Manson that shattered my world. I hear the shower running. I think I see Tom in my shower? And who's this woman under the sheets in my bed? What the fu- a loud screech causes Tom to turn off the shower. He wraps the towel around him and leaves the bathroom. What is that? The woman asks Tom. Stay here, I'm going to check it out. 
I'm going with you, the woman named Amy replied. Don't go down there, I say aloud in my sleep as the dream continued. Tom makes it halfway down the stairs. The screeching noise gets louder. He stops halfway down the steps. Amy, the woman he cheated with, has a sheet wrapped around her and freezes. She starts to shake with fear. She had never heard such an awful sound. The back door. It's coming from the back door, Tom whispers. Don't go. Just call the police, Amy stammered. It's probably just the dog. Tom continued down the steps and headed for the back door leading to the kitchen. Don't open the door. I scream and sit straight up in bed. My nightgown is soaked with sweat and the fear inside of me doesn't want to know the end of the dream. I slowly get out of bed and make it to the bathroom. I lift the toilet seat and feel like I could hurl. But nothing comes and I now hold on to the sink, keeping myself upright even though my legs are like jelly. I look up in the mirror. Hello, Olivia. I close my eyes and needles, hot and piercing, feel like they are penetrating my skin all over my body. I shake my head. No, no, no. With the morning dream and bathroom episode behind me, I head to work. I am barely keeping myself together. My dreams, they are haunting me more each night. Lauren and I would have fun tonight, and maybe these dreams will vanish. Maybe I should cancel. Call Lauren and tell her I'm not feeling my best. No, no, I will go. I must pull myself together. Finally, Friday night has arrived. It's time to put this all behind me. I am trying to convince myself that dreams are just that. They mostly have no basis. But maybe only a slight reality of happening in your life sparks all the other fears inside of you. You wake up, and they disappear. I am ready to meet Lauren at the new bar. I take a deep breath, put my car in gear, and head to the new bar. 4. Lauren texted me and said she already had a place for us to sit. Naturally, she beat me there as she was always the early bird. I enter the bar and is nicely decorated with modern taste giving the appearance of a fun place to be. The atmosphere was all about something exciting tonight. The customers were buzzing and a DJ is playing the thumping music. I see Lauren has a table for us already and I tell the host I am going to be with my friend as I point to Lauren. I walk ahead to meet Lauren. Hey Olivia, I'm so glad you came. It's so good to be out together again. Lauren said loudly over the blaring music flipping her blonde hair over her shoulder. It's good to be here. I just hope we can hear each other over this music, Olivia countered. Isn't this the best place? Surely we can find a nice guy in this place. It really seems popular, Lauren said. It sure does, Olivia responded, looking to the left and noticing a handsome man staring at her from the long U-shaped bar to her left. Lauren noticed Olivia staring at the man. Did you find one already? Lauren quizzed Olivia. Oh, he is cute, but I'm not quite settled in with you. How was your week? Olivia asked, turning away from the man at the bar. Oh, doll, work is work. But there is a new hire at the office that I really like. I told him we were coming here tonight. Maybe he will show up. Oh, great. Just what I need. I don't want to be a third wheel. Not my idea of fun. Can Lauren just be my friend and not always have to be after every guy she meets? I was looking forward to some conversation. Guess that won't be happening. Suddenly, I snap out of my Debbie Downer thoughts and there is a nice looking guy at our table. Olivia, this is Jerry Anderson. Jerry, this is my best friend Olivia. Nice to meet you, Olivia. I've heard a lot about you from Lauren. Nice to meet you as well. I offer back. Lauren and Jerry have a conversation about work and my attention drifts back to the man at the bar. While I stare, Jerry and Lauren go to the dance floor and I'm left alone. Oh well, third wheel I guess it is for tonight. 
the handsome man from the bar is walking towards me. Me, Olivia, the one with the fractured outlook on life. Me, the dud and third wheel. Hello, seems like your friends left you alone. Mind if I sit for a second? I came alone and I noticed you from the bar. Something stuck out to me about you. You just appear different than most people who hang out on a Friday. Seems to me you might need some good conversation. My name is Nathan Grissom, he said, holding his hand out to shake. I'm Olivia. That's my friend Lauren out there dancing with her new friend from work. So she left me here to fend for myself. Well, Olivia, you may have done better than ending up with me, but you could have done worse. Can I sit down? Sure, help yourself. I offered, noticing his neat haircut, kind facial features, and eyes. Oh, his eyes. They were beautiful. He lowers his tall and fit body to our table, and he looks directly into my eyes. I feel as I've seen you before. Not a pickup line. Just thinking I may know you from somewhere. You seem familiar, yet you are remarkably beautiful. I don't think I would have forgotten you, Nathan started. I blushed immediately, his eyes taking over. It was quite remarkable that his eyes were holding my attention like that. It was embarrassing. I recovered quickly. Well, thank you for that. I haven't been out too much lately. Lorna and I wanted to check out this new place tonight. To be honest, I haven't had much opportunity to date since, well, since my divorce. I'm sorry, Nathan answered as he looked away from Lauren and Jerry, then quickly returning his attention to me. Look, I must leave soon. I can only stay a few more minutes. I have to meet family. But can I see you again? I'd like to call and set up a real date, so maybe you can give me your number and I will call you and set up something for us? That is, if you want to. His eyes, those beautiful eyes, tell me he was sincere. So I write my number down for him. He takes the number and reaches his hand out to shake mine. I take his hand to consecrate the future date and notice how cold his hand was. Really cold. Contradicting his warm and sexually attractive eyes. Ice cold. He smiles and turns to walk away. What in the hell did I just do? Jerry and Lauren come back from dancing and I am still in a trance about how cold his hand was. It didn't fit what his eyes were saying. I shake it off and my evening continues with me being that third wheel I despised being when I hang out with Lauren. She had a guy and I always went home alone. This night is going to be no different. I'm such a drip. 5. I get back home around 11 and quickly hang my coat on one of the hooks on the coat tree and head up the stairs. I can't quit thinking about Nathan. His eyes as hot as fire, and his hands, well, as cold as ice. Nathan also reminded me of someone, but I can't put my finger on it. Was it Tom? Shit, I certainly hope not. What a mistake Tom was. Married him because I loved him. He married me so he could cheat. I tried, but I just couldn't make it work. Tom, the cheating bastard. My eyes begin to tear up as I sit on my bed in my robe. My phone rings and I quickly answer it, not looking to see who it is. I assume it must be Lauren wanting to tell me about how wonderful Jerry, the new guy from work, was. But it wasn't Lauren's voice. Hello, Olivia. Who is this? I ask, not recognizing the voice immediately. It's Nathan, you know, from the bar tonight. Hello, Nathan. Sorry I didn't recognize the voice. I barely got to know you. That's why I called. I wanted to know if I could come by. I am finished with the family meeting and thought maybe we could talk more. I'd really like to get to know you better, Nathan said. Before I respond, I think to myself, no fucking way. But I relent and say yes. Those eyes, so pretty, but those hands, so cold. Sure, Nathan, sure. I say, getting over my Debbie Downer syndrome. Give me your address and I'll be there in just a few minutes, Olivia. I give him my address and wonder all the while, is this okay? It seems even more dangerous than internet dating sites. 
I must be going out on a limb here. What makes it okay for him to come here? I hang up and Nathan Grissom will be on his way soon. What did I just do? I hurried back upstairs to put on something casual. Maybe just a bit seductive, but revealing enough to at least draw Nathan's interest. I do go slow, but there are times when, you know, you just need someone to look at you in a different way. Nathan arrives in about a half an hour. I let him in and ask him if he'd like something to drink. He asked for a whiskey, and I poured myself a wine. We sit and chat for a while, and he begins to flirt with me. He moves closer to me and tries to kiss me. I give in to his handsome eyes as our lips are about to meet. His kiss is, well, not what I expected. His lips seem cool to me, not hot like I was hoping for. But I suggest we go upstairs to my room. I'm surprised I am moving this fast. For some reason, his eyes are controlling me, making me want him. We made love for quite some time and fell asleep in each other's arms. I woke later and slipped out of the covers, quietly heading downstairs. Nathan was good. Very good indeed. But aren't all the Nathans and Toms in the world the same? Love you for a while? Cheat on you when they get tired of you? Use you for what they want? but skip the emotional love and friendship, quit doing things for you, quit being considerate of your needs, quit fucking listening. I once again felt that old flash of heat, the flash my therapist wanted me to overcome, that fucking Tom. I grabbed the kitchen sink to keep myself from falling, my legs weakening with each hateful thought, but my upper body gaining a familiar strength. Nathan steps into the shower and feels the hot water soothe his cool skin. As he begins to wash himself, he hears a loud screeching noise. He stops and listens, but Nathan thinks it must be bad pipes. He finishes his shower and turns off the water. He hears it again. Another screech, this time louder than the next. He wraps a towel around him and heads for the landing outside of the bedroom. Olivia! Hey, Olivia! Nathan calls out. No answer. Another screech. The loudest of them all makes Nathan cringe. Hey, Olivia, where are you? Olivia! No answer again. Nathan walks towards the back door and the scratching and screeching continues. Maybe Olivia is hurt. I need to check. A voice inside of my head is saying, Please, Nathan... Please don't open that door. Nathan reaches for the handle and turns it to open the door. Nathan, do not open that door. A voice in person that Nathan cannot see or hear commands him. Too late. Nathan opens the door. I am standing there. Hello, Nathan. Her strong right arm with claws attached to the end reach for Nathan's throat. He is stunned and shocked, not being able to move a muscle. Olivia lifts him off the ground and squeezes, puncturing his neck and causing blood to spatter all over. Nathan's face is bright red and finally his body goes limp and lifeless, collapsing to the ground. Darkness. I told him not to open the door. I tried, but he wouldn't listen. He would have just been another Tom. He would have cheated on me. I drag his body out to the old apple tree near the shed in my backyard. I retrieve the shovel from the shed and begin to dig. My thoughts excuse me for my actions. Just another Tom. Finally, the hole is finished, and I dump the body next to where I laid cheating Tom to rest. I covered the hole and said, You belong together. I put the shovel away and begin to walk back to the house. I clean up the rest of the blood and then go inside. I will get rid of his car and clothes in a while, I tell myself. Exhausted and my super strength leaving my body, I sit down. It's that fucking Tom. It's his fault. The phone rings and it's Lauren on the other line. Lauren begins blabbing about her date with Jerry and I just listen, bored to tears. What about your guy? The one you met at the bar tonight? Do you think you'll hear from him again? Lauren asks. I really doubt it, I say. 
I really doubt it. I hope you enjoyed tonight's production of Olivia, written by Malcolm Tanner. Malcolm Tanner is an accomplished writer, was a contributor in the book Education Belly Slappers by Jim Rowe. Malcolm followed the Mike Parsons trilogy, Redemption, which was recently released on Audible, performed by yours truly, Redemption 2, Allison's Revenge, Redemption 3, Death at Downers Grove, with a new literary titan gold medal winning book that he released March 14, 2021, entitled Drowning My Suspicions. You can go to his website at www.malcolmtanner.com. That's M-A-L-C-O-L-M-T-A-N-N-E-R.com. There you can find his books, in the news, stories, human interest stories, and a place to sign up for his email list. Malcolm Tanner can also be followed on Facebook at MT Followers, also at Malcolm Tanner LLC, or on Instagram at Malcolm Tanner 8927. Nestled in the quiet little town of Riverside, Ohio, Jimmy's Toys was once the greatest toy store you could ever imagine. Designed to resemble a grand medieval castle, it was truly the crowning achievement of the town's only strip mall. Jimmy's biggest promotion was their birthday club. Any kid from birth to 12 years old could stop by their treasure room and pick up a free toy on their birthday and a chance to win the adventure of a lifetime. For one unlucky child in the fall of 89, that adventure quickly became a nightmare-fueled odyssey. And now for your indulgence, Jimmy's Toys by Raz T. Slasher. When I was growing up, we had an amazing toy store in our town. It was designed to resemble a medieval castle with multiple floors and took up an enormous portion of a nearby strip mall. You wouldn't find national toy brands like Mattel or Fisher-Price there, though. Instead, they catered largely to independent toy companies you've likely never heard of and local craftsmen. The toys they did have were every bit as interesting as the store itself. There were wooden toys of all kinds, handmade dolls, puzzles, board games, and even an entire floor dedicated to miniatures and model trains. The most important feature of the store was what they referred to as the treasure room. The treasure room was so important because it was tied to a special event at Jimmy's Toys. If your parents signed you up for their birthday club, you would receive an invitation in the mail to visit it. It was always a card wishing you a happy birthday from King Jimmy and contained an invitation to the treasure room and a small metal key taped inside. Your parents would take you to the store to present your invitation and you would be ushered down to the basement level to pick out a free toy. The key added another level to the event entirely. Each key had the chance to unlock a huge treasure chest in the middle of the room. I had no idea what was inside of the chest, nor did anyone I knew personally. There were a lot of rumors, but whatever was inside of it had to be worth a fortune. The downside of the birthday club is that it only lasted until you were 12. In some ways, I guess that makes sense. Teenagers go through a lot of changes and appreciate the magic of the world around them less, but it still bummed me out. I dreaded my last trip to the glorious treasure room, knowing it would be my last. Our little town was booming, and there were new faces everywhere you looked and many of the people you had known seemed to disappear overnight. Living so close to an Air Force base, that kind of thing was somewhat expected, but the older I got, the more it bothered me. My little world was changing rapidly, and soon my last vestige of childhood, the treasure room at Jimmy's Toys, would disappear along with it. The dreaded day finally came when I received my birthday card, invitation, and key from King Jimmy. With a reluctant sigh, my mother swept me away for one last magical expedition. She knew how upset I'd been, so she made it extra special that year. We got lunch at McDonald's beforehand, and she told me we'd go to the local dairy a couple towns over for ice cream after. 
that did a lot to lift my spirits, but something in the back of my mind kept me from enjoying it as much as I should have. I descended the steps into the treasure room slowly, wanting to memorize every detail so I could remember it forever. I wandered around that room with its castle wallpaper and red velvet curtains for so long both my mother and the staff were becoming impatient. Not wanting to push my luck, I chose a wooden marionette crafted to look like a court jester. It seemed like a fitting parting gift at the time. I was urged towards the giant treasure chest in the center of the room and presented my key to the staff member. She pressed a button on top of the chest and the sound of trumpets momentarily filled the room from unseen speakers. I was in shock when the key turned and a series of clicks sounded in the now silent space. I couldn't believe it when I saw the chest slid opening. Inside the giant chest was an open space with a ladder that descended into a golden glowing light. It was only large enough for me to fit into and the staff member explained it was an experience for just children and my mother would have to wait for my return. She was promised that it would only take 20 minutes, so she let me go. I jumped inside that chest and climbed down the ladder as quickly as I could. When I reached the bottom, I was mesmerized by the golden light that filled the room. There was an enormous scroll on the wall in front of me that framed a gilded door. The scroll congratulated me and explained that I had been personally chosen by King Jimmy to explore the secrets of the lost treasure and would be greatly rewarded for my effort. I rushed through the door and into the darkness beyond. Simulated torches lit up as I approached them, finding myself in what appeared to be an underground passage. My excitement peaked as I traversed the winding path. I couldn't believe something like that existed beneath a toy store, no matter how cool the place was. Speaking of cool, I could even feel a cold draft on my skin the farther down the path I went. When I started smelling something that my brain associated with the smell of a sewer, I was astonished. They had obviously spent a lot of time building this and had paid close attention to even the smallest details. There was no way my friends would believe me when I told them. Eventually, the passage dead ended into a small square room. I was disappointed at first, but my excitement spiked again and quickly overshadowed it. I was here to discover the secrets of the lost treasure so obviously, there had to be something I was overlooking. I ran my hand over each wall, feeling for anything that seemed out of place. In no time at all, my fingertips found a brick on one of those walls that stuck off farther than the others. With a joyous shout, I pressed on it, and the wall before me slid open to reveal a scroll around another gilded door. The scroll congratulated me on completing the treacherous journey through the underground tunnels of the kingdom. It said that the bittersweet part of every journey was that it would eventually come to an end. I found out that every child on their 12th birthday that ventured into the treasure room was given a key that would lead them here. It was King Jimmy's way of giving back to the children that loved his kingdom so much throughout the years. When I retrieved the treasure in the next room, I had to promise to never reveal its secrets in order to do my part in keeping the magic alive for others. It further explained that when I was ready, I should open the door and enter. King Jimmy was anxiously awaiting me on the other side to hand deliver my reward. Every ounce of despair I had had in me about this day was wiped away. I was part of something larger than myself now, and it overwhelmed me with pride. It was my first big taste of the responsibilities that awaited me now that I was getting older. I took a deep breath to let that sink in before opening the door and stepping into the darkness beyond once more. I heard the door close and the lock clicked behind me in the darkness. I didn't pay much attention at the time. I was too focused on what I would discover ahead. A few steps farther in and golden lights popped into existence to reveal the scene before me. This room was nearly identical to the main treasure room above, but without all the toys. In the center of the wall in front of me sat an animatronic king upon his throne before a closed golden chest. Thinking back on it now, it reminds me of the creepy king you see these days in Burger King commercials. There was something off about that strange, ever-present smile that creeped me out a little. When I approached King Jimmy, I could hear the whirling mechanisms that eventually brought him to life. He greeted me with a simple wave and his mouth moved along with a recorded message thanking me for finding the lost treasure. He invited me closer and asked me to kneel next to the box before him. I hurried into place, my eyes focusing on the golden chest next to me. 
I only looked away when I sensed movement extremely close to my head. I looked up and noticed that King Jimmy was placing a fake sword to each side of my head as the message informed me that I would now and forever be a knight of his kingdom. It was time for me to open the chest and claim my destiny. When King Jimmy moved back into a neutral position and ceased to move or speak, I opened the box. I thrust my hands inside to claim my prize before my eyes registered the contents. I had submerged my hands into a foul-smelling substance that had the look and consistency of warm raspberry jelly. Just as it oozed over my skin and several sets of human eyeballs fought their way to the surface, I heard a door open next to King Jimmy's throne. A man dressed in a dirty old court jester costume emerged and yanked me to my feet. I could smell the same foul stench from the treasure chest all over him. Still in his grip, he forced me into his arms and carried me into the room behind the throne. The bells on his costume made a dull jingle with every step he took, as if many of the bells were broken or somehow prevented from making their usual sound. As shocked as I was, I knew this had to be part of the lost treasure story. Finding the treasure had been too easy, so surely there had to be some final challenge. Maybe the court jester character was trying to steal King Jimmy's throne? The inside of this room looked more like a dungeon cell, solidifying my belief that this was part of the experience. I was shoved up into a child-sized cage that hung from the ceiling and locked within. I stayed silent and carefully scanned my surroundings. Other than the way I'd been brought in, I could see the edge of what I thought was a trapdoor in the floor below me. I also noticed a normal dungeon cell in one of the corners. Inside of it was another animatronic, dressed and painted to look just like a court jester. I found it weird that they would have an animatronic and a real person playing the same character but it did make sense that there would be an actual person down here in case something went wrong. The man spun my cage around slowly, his eyes never looking away. I noticed some of the raspberry jelly stuff all over his big scraggly salt and pepper beard. Had he been eating it? Gross! He started mumbling something I couldn't completely hear. It was only the last line that became audible to me. I'll show them who the real king is around here. Aha! The court jester was a usurper to King Jimmy's throne. I'd read about a situation like this in one of my dad's old fantasy books. The plot was thickening. As I slowly revolved in my little cage, I went back to scanning the room. Back at the dead end, I had to search for a hidden brick to get out. There had to be some sort of trigger to release me from my confinement and away past the court jester to the trap door. As I scanned, the man slid open a panel I hadn't noticed yet. Something fell out of it that he quickly began stuffing back in with his foot. All I caught was what looked like a kid's light-up shoe turning on and off every time he kicked at it. He stepped back and closed the panel. When he turned around, I saw a big knife in his left hand. It was also covered in that terrible raspberry jelly stuff. He began to laugh as he crept closer. He must have walked right into a sensor though because the animatronic version of the court jester suddenly came to life. The bells attached to it jingled furiously. A recorded voice filled the room as its mechanical mouth moved in rhythm. The animatronic court jester informed us to remember the promise we made and that it was no laughing matter. If we destroyed the magic for other children, we'd wind up in the dungeon just like him. The man stared at the animatronic for a moment and then refocused on me. It finally set in that whatever was happening right now was definitely not part of the show. I began rattling the cage and screaming as loud as my little lungs would allow. Still, the man crept closer, the dull jingle punctuating each of his steps. I kicked out at him from between the cage bars when he made it close enough to me, my continued shrieks for help echoing in the small space. The blade of the knife scraped my left leg and I winced. The pain was immediate. Luck was with me down in the dungeon that day, though. My right foot connected with the hand that held the knife, knocking it halfway across the room. When he moved to pick it up, I scanned the cage one more time in desperation. I shifted my body as I looked, finally finding a small safety latch beneath me. I pulled the latch as hard as I could and the bottom of the cage swung down, plummeting me towards the trapdoor below. My body hit it hard enough to break it open and I tumbled down a couple steps. I lay on my back, staring up through the broken trapdoor as I tried to catch my breath. I hurt everywhere, but instinctively I knew that nothing was broken. 
I was getting ready to pull myself to my feet and make a run for it when the man's face peered down at me from above. He slowly descended the stairs with his dull jingles pointing the knife in my direction. I sat up and started crawling backwards as fast as I could to get some space between us. A wall ten feet back stopped me in my tracks. Just as the man moved to hover over me and bring the knife down, a police officer burst through the door I hadn't noticed was next to me. He tackled the deranged court jester to the ground and cuffed him with the help of another officer that ran in behind him. A third officer arrived in the room and carefully picked me up. He rushed me through another long and winding corridor like the one that had led to the throne room and out into the store itself where the store manager was waiting next to my frantic mother. When the ambulance arrived, I was wrapped in a warm blanket and checked out by the paramedics. I ended up with a lot of bruising, a minor concussion, and a nasty gash on my left leg. I was taken to the hospital for overnight observation and 17 stitches. The police met us at the hospital and I answered every question to the best of my ability. We found out that the man who attacked me was an ex-employee of Jimmy's Toys. He had been with the store since it first opened and was fired a couple months ago for drinking on the job. He then assaulted the manager and several employees before fleeing the scene. They had been unable to find him until now. A week later, a breaking news bulletin interrupted my Saturday morning cartoon programming. It turns out that the remains of several children and their families were found in the sub-basement of Jimmy's Toys. The news shocked our entire community. Jimmy's Toys hung around for another year before the grisly events and our town's first Walmart put them out of business. The entire strip mall went under shortly after. As you can imagine, the story quickly became urban legend material. Teenagers and urban explorers alike took to the tunnels below with their cameras and a legend was born. They say that if you descend into the tunnels beneath the treasure room, you will find King Jimmy and his court jester down there waiting for you. Their animatronic bodies will come to life and chase you all the way to the store's front entrance. If you're too slow, they'll drag you back to the dungeon and torture you forever. The castle for Jimmy's toys still stands there to this day, enticing those who pass by to come inside and discover the secrets of the lost treasure. Hope you enjoyed tonight's tale, Jimmy's Toys by Raz T. Slasher. Raz T. Slasher is a modern day bard, heavily influenced by horror and speculative fiction. When he isn't killing people, he enjoys spending time with his family and friends, worshiping the great Kalalu, hanging out with his cats Crowley and HPL, reading, gaming, talking to himself loudly in public, and writing bios in third person. Proving you can't spell crazy without R-A-Z. You can find him at RazTSlasher.com. That's R-A-Z-T-S-L-A-S-H-E-R.com. Yes, RazTSlasher.com. Or wherever toys are sold. Now with Kung Fu Action Grip. If you enjoyed tonight's story, hosted by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley, you can search my name on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for additional previous stories. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks. Available now on audible.com or just visit paulsbooks.net. That's P A U L S B O O K S dot net. You can also find me personally on Facebook and Twitter. And with that, listeners, our weekly journey into the psyche has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And while you're at it, please remember to stop by our Apple Podcast page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and subscribe. 
The charts are based on subscriptions, not listens. So if you haven't subscribed yet, I'd really appreciate it. I'm your host for Fear from the Heartland, Paul J. McSorley. I've enjoyed the titillation tonight. Ooh, there's that word again. Thank you for joining me. Hope to see you again next week at Fear from the Heartland. Chilling Tales for Dark Night.